Greetings! Welcome back to the Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel, where we're doing another video on some bone carving. And these first bone carving videos I'm treating as a skill building series, where each video builds on and adds a little bit more technique or complexity to the previous. The first was the needle, the bone needle carving video that I put up a couple of weeks ago. This one is going to be this little fish hook. Okay, so this is a natural form fish hook. And this comes from the large pastern of a cow, which is this bone. Sometimes this is called a coffin bone because of its shape. And you can see how this fish hook is a natural form, which is right in that bone. When you cut the two sides off, you're left with the hollow middle, which can quite nicely, and I'm not going to say easy, it takes some time, it takes some effort, but relatively simply manufactured into this beautiful little fish hook. Okay. Now, I'm going to make three fish hooks in this series. This natural form fish hook is the first. The second will be a two-piece composite fish hook. And the third is going to be a one-piece fully carved ornate fish hook. So again, adding a little bit of complexity as we go through each one. I was going to combine some of this into one video, so as you see some of the footage, I may be talking a little bit in those terms. As I was getting into it, it was clear if I tried to combine all of this, it was going to be way too long and nobody would watch it. So it's three videos <laughs> instead of uh, one or two videos as I had initially planned. So without further ado, let's get into it and start working on this fish hook. This little tool that I have is often called a bench hook. Some people also call it a carving cradle. Um, it's just a couple of pieces of scraps, right? This is scraps that have been drilled into and cut off and mangled. And I just have one flat piece of scrap and two smaller pieces of scrap and just cut them and just put them together with some white school glue, right? You can use yellow glue, white school glue, Elmer's, whatever. It's just handy, okay? And I'll usually just glue one, set something to prop it, glue the other, let them sit there with gravity. You don't even have to clamp it. This is a throwaway tool, right? Um, but you need something so that when you start to cut the bone, okay, you can push against here and have it hold. So it'll just resist. If this pops out, fine, I'll glue it back on, I don't care. If I need some woogity shape in this, I'll just take a file and cut out a chunk or a chisel and cut out a chunk. And when it's too woogity to be useful, I'll make a new one, throw it in the fire where, where it would have been to begin with. Okay. So do make yourself a bench hook if you're gonna get into this sort of carving. Don't overthink your bench hook. If you ask, well, I don't have a pattern for that bench hook, you're asking the wrong question, right? Don't overthink your bench hook. Do make one, don't overthink it. Um, I have two here. This one just has, is a little wider. Is that a view? Mm -hmm. Okay. This one is a little wider and my strip is a little bit thinner. So when I get to working on a smaller piece, it'll be a little bit more convenient. This one's a little fatter, so it'll hold a bigger piece better. If your bench hook isn't working, Modify it. It's junk glued together with junk. So don't overthink it. Junk glued together with other junk, right? Now, what we want to do is find that lovely wafer inside of this gnarly old bone. And if you could see how it was cut, we want the middle strip and to cut off the two sides. Mm -hmm. So we hold it against the bench hook, and I'm just holding it at a slight angle. If you have, just because of this crook here, makes it a little easier to get into. Um, if I didn't have this little crook here, I could just glue another strip here and go to it right there, but it's just, this is just works. Um, if you don't, if it's not working, make a different one. That's really just it. Now, the best tool for this is just a common hacksaw. In terms of power tools, you can use a fret saw or scroll saw for this, and you can use a 
um, bandsaw for this, but I would recommend you don't because of how fiddly this is. A power tool is going to rip this out of your hand to cut your fingers off. But if you want to rig up some little jig, that's on you. <laughs> if uh, you are doing that, though, make absolutely sure you wear dust protection. Again, bone dust, I said this in other videos, is a silicosis risk. You can see doing this this way, I'm not making any dust. It's just sitting right there on the bone. But if you start getting power tools involved in the process, you're going to raise dust. Okay? So we just cut it, holding it against here with the hacksaw. Okay. If I need to cut into the wood, I'll cut into the wood. No big deal. Now, if you look at the geometry of this, this first cut, I'm going through this whole thickness. There's a lot of resistance. Once I get down into the pithy section, it will cut much faster. And the blade just kind of disappears like that. Okay. Now, just kind of keep carrying the cut along. And this is the nice thing about this sort of carving cradle, is once you have your cut established, you just kind of prop it in dozens of different positions. I have some of these where I put that lower part in the middle and I clamp it into a vise when I want to work standing up. I've seen people made so that they would sit on their laps well and use it as sort of a cutting board on top of their laps when carving. It all works. I'm just going to turn it in a different plane. Drawer pops open. That's okay. It's an old sewing machine table that I'm working on here because it was handy. The sewing machine no longer works. Don't worry. I'm not going to fill up a good sewing machine with bone dust. This is kind of the hard one. We need to get up on this angle. You're going to cut yourself. Yeah. That's also kind of an advantage to a hacksaw is they're not real aggressive teeth in terms of doing damage to you. Comment still holds that. I'm a clumsy person. That last little bit is always the hardest to hold and get into. And have to do it this way. It's bouncing out. Now if it bounces out, a trick you can do is take a file, take the corner, and make a little groove for the blade like that. They're still fiddling. matching up perfectly, but should be able to, not quite, you need to go a little more, not quite ready to break. There we go. Now, I got a little bit off center on that one, you know, compared to this one, but see, it's mostly the same thing. Now, the marrow pocket is all in there. This one doesn't have a whole lot of marrow on it, but I, w I will keep this. That's a nice, relatively flat piece for making an inlay or carving some other little thing out of. Mm -hmm. So since these are kind of greasy, I'm chucking the other two are in here. Just chucking them in some soapy water. Just degrease them overnight, like mm -hmm. that. And 
dripping soapy water. And then you would do the other side. Now, when I'm not doing this as a demonstration, I would cut it so that I have both sides cut almost all the way through because the smaller it gets, the harder it is to hold. So doing it this way and cutting one side all the way off is making myself a little bit of trouble for next time. Um, it's just going to take longer to worry my way through there. But if you can leave, you know, cut down halfway, you know, half through here and then half through there, leave them attached, you'll be a little better off. But for now, I'm just going to set that aside and talk about the next step on this one. Okay. And that's just going to be to smooth it off. Now, two ways to do that. One is with a file. Okay. And we could just again, you see I'm stopping it again, this stop. Put it whatever angle I like and file it down. And that makes pretty quick work. Now, I have three Farrier's files, which is what I would prefer to use for this. I can't find any of them right now. So I'm using not my favorite file, but that's okay. Okay, it still works. If you're going to do a lot of this, you would get yourself a Farrier's Rasp. Okay, it's the best. Um, and I'm just going to take this all down until I have most of this webbing. I'm going to leave a little bit of this webbing just for a little extra thickness. Okay, I'm going to take most of it out of there and get a centered piece that, since this is about three mils thick, I want to go, I'll have it three or four millimeters wide. Okay, so you just grind down to that point. Now, if you're doing a small bone like this, you're not going to want to try and cut this with a hacksaw. So this, you would just go right to the file as your first step. And just file away until you're left with the gap in the middle. Right? That's what you would do on a small piece like this. If you don't have files, you can use sandpaper. If you don't have sandpaper, you can use a rock. I've shown this before. So just a random piece of sandstone that I picked up in the woods near near my house here. And you can just rub the piece here on the rock. Okay? And that is roughly equivalent to about 80 grit sandpaper. Right? So if you can imagine how long it would take to do this on 80 grit sandpaper, it's about the same as a rock. Um, also, you know, you, you can use chunks, you could break, split off little pieces of this and use them as files if you want to get into those specific areas. You know? But, totally legitimate, you can use a piece of cinder block and rub this off. So don't think because you don't have one specific tool that you can't do a project. That just means you need to think it through and come up with another option, another set of tools. And I'm confident, no matter where you live or how urban it is, you can at a bare minimum come up with some version of a piece of stone or cinder block. Okay? Now, this is long and repetitive, so I'm not going to torture you with a real long video where I'm just sanding things. I'm going to get this piece down to the shape and size that I want for the next step, and then we'll join back. So we've made a bit of progress. I did a whole bunch of filing and sanding on these two faces. You can see my little pile of dust over there. And it's still a little bit wider than it is thick, but it's in a nice workable thickness we can continue. And I'm gonna leave that a little bit of an oval cross section. Now, what we want to look at here, and why I did a little bit of 220 grit sanding, just so that I could see all of the surfaces, is we need to carve away the spongy material, and these bones always have spongy material close to the gross plates. Now, these two sides are quite solid, because these take the entire weight of the cow when it's walking around. 
this spongy material helps absorb shock, which is going into the ends of the bone. But we don't want to carve into this and be left with that spongy material as the only thing holding the point on our hook. So I want to carve through the spongy material and to get into good solid bone before I make final decisions as to where I'm going to put the hook, especially here at the bend. Um, this is going to get cut off about there, so I don't care about this material down here. It's just going to get cut off anyway. But here, I want to go exploring and get most of that out. Now for this, I'm switching to a half round file. You could also use a rat tail file, would be perfectly fine. You can even use a triangular file if you keep it moving, right? But this half round is, is convenient and handy and will, will work nicely. And just like before, I'm just going to work it down. Keep it moving. Even with a curved file, you want to keep it moving so you get a nice profile. And you break your file. They're brittle. That's okay. What you just observed is also why I don't like repurposing files in my blacksmithing work. Because all of those teeth have little stress fractures in the bottom of them. The grain in that was nice. There was no manufacturing defect. It was just the tooth itself it creates a weakness which makes it easy to break. I was putting a little bit more pressure on it than I should have because I'm trying to do this quickly for the sake of the videoing. Okay, you can see it, we make pretty quick work out of that. Nice coarse file does a lot of good quickly. It's getting into more solid bone. Just keep working it and examining it. A little rough spot in there. I did find my farrier's rasp just to show everybody what they look like. And this is the side I usually use for this kind of bone carving. That's an old dull one, but still good for a lot of this sort of beater work. Now I've got a nice curve in there. Now I want to work off some of the irregularities on the outside. Just kind of take off the worst from both directions that you don't end up doing all of the work from one side and end up wishing that you had material where you no longer do. The tooth pattern on this one is getting caught in diverting the file. So I'll switch back to this one. Or actually, no, since I have it. This is my favorite for this sort of bulk removal. Not because this fine side cuts a whole lot faster than the other files, but because it has such a wide, flat face, it makes it very easy to see what angle you're cutting at and reference things. Now this is a natural material. When you're working a natural material, you don't always get to choose every contour in the final surface. Right? You're working with it. You don't have full control over it.
you can also see here how indispensable some form of carving crate is. And why I make them, you know, cheaply out of whatever scrap is sitting around, because it's an expendable part that you're going to destroy in use. I'm just going to run the file edge right against it to help me reference where it is. I'm just working for a nice, flat, even set of contours on this piece of bone. So, in the interest of brevity, I'm going to turn the camera off now. I'm going to keep working this down, and when we get ready to cut out the final shape, we'll rejoin. Okay, so I've rounded this off, and I've done the least amount of work on here as I can and still have a reasonable shape. The reason being, a lot of this spongy material goes almost all the way to the edge. Now, that doesn't mean it's completely devoid of, of structural integrity, but it does mean that I'm going to leave it thick here, <laughs> right, to keep as much of that integrity as I can. So you can see the shape of the hook starting to develop in here at this point. And now I want to cut off the big block in this corner. So just to kind of mark where I'm going with just a file so you can see the groove, um, I'm going to cut it right along there. So this will be the top. And I'm going to cut it again right here in the middle. So that will be that will be the bottom. So I'm going to cut off this square. Now to get it started, I'm just going to brace it here against this little bench hook. And if it'll behave, <laughs> um, start the groove with. Let's jump up on you there. Gives a little bit of radius to go to this desk. Okay. Thank you, hon. Trying to do this so that the camera can see it too. Start a little groove there with the file. And then we will go back to cutting gently and carefully. No need to be in a rush. If I was doing this in a proper workshop, I'd put a little clamp on the side of that. Okay. My fingers are underneath the saw blade, but this is going to bottom on the wood before it gets to my fingers. There we go. Thank you, beloved. So there's the first cut. And then down here, that I'm going to cut entirely with the file. Because we're starting to get into some fragile cross sections. And those teeth can grab a bit more than I want them to sometimes. So we're just going to cut through this. Try to make sure. Get my fingers out of the way for a minute. Just using the corner of the file as a saw. And that's okay, hon. The last little eights did split out there, but that's okay. And there, we definitely have something that looks very fish hooky. Okay? So that's good. Bone is brittle. You don't want to ever put bone in any kind of vice. You really don't. So this is now a nice natural form fish hook blank. Okay. Now from here we're just looking at finishing. So I need to 
manufacture a good way to attach it, I need to flatten off the bottom and I need to file a point in here and then just round things off a little bit. So I want to look at the top here first. I don't want to put downward pressure. What you don't want to do now is put a lot of downward pressure on that. You will snap that bend. Okay. It's strong, but it's only so strong. Okay. So I'm going to put in a little bit of a, a protrusion here. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to cut just a little bit of a notch down below it. You can see this is solid, that is spongy. So I don't want to cut too deep. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a little bit. Then I'm going to taper the front off. This will allow for tying a um, Polynesian style snood lashing for attaching this hook to a line. So I'm just evening things up a little bit here. Okay. This is small files, gentle work. And again, the natural shape of the bone is your primary pattern. with this sort of carving. You do not have unlimited leeway in how you shape this. Okay, So I would love to go a little bit deeper with that, but in this corner I'm already right down to kind of the marrowy bone. Mm -hmm. On this corner I have some leeway yet, but I'm just going to quit there. You know, Don't push it too far. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to leave a little bit of extra thickness under there, but I get a lot of this gone. Okay. Again, just filing that way. And then we will trim this and taper it down in with the bigger files. Just even up and taper in. And that's going to take a bit of time to work on. Okay. Um, the tip, same deal. I'm going to file it in from both directions. Being careful, you see how I'm pressing from there to there and I'm not putting force on the outside of this, right? Don't hold it here and press. Okay, that will break. That will break. Don't clamp it in a vise. That will break. Just use your carving cradle. Wedge it in. And work on it. Okay, you can start to see a point starting to come in. Obviously there's a lot more work to do. And then when I've all done all of that, I'm going to round it off. Okay. And I'll bring the tip in substantially more, and I'll have an even taper from the tip back to here. I'm going to leave this full thickness and just round it a little bit. And that I'm going to take the sharp edges off and not do a whole lot on, because that back of the hook doesn't need to be any particular size. It's just carrying the point around. Okay. And this, I'm going to do a lot of work here on the front, bringing that down to a point so that a line can be attached to it. So I'm going to work on this and I'll give you an update. So here we go. This is pretty much the final outline in all dimensions that I'm going to use. Okay, see it's a nice little hook there. Uh, what we need to do is just final sharpening of the tip and rounding things over. Now whenever you're rounding something off you have the square octagon round rule. Okay, this is the most efficient way to produce a carved round object. So when you're shaping and blocking it out and getting it to the dimensions you want, you work in the square because it's easier to get things nice and true 
in a square section than it is to try and maintain a round section while getting them nice and straight and true. Mm -hmm. So everything I've done up to this point has been square to rectangular. Okay. Now, when you go to round things over, you want to come and file the corners off. And again, make an, a flat plane while you're doing it. Okay, and I've done a little bit of work here already. Okay. And then we can come over here on the tip. We can try to make sure it's in view for you. I love these small half round files. They're one of the nicest, neatest, versatile files that you'll ever get in your kit. And the reason you want to do it this way is because you establish straight lines and you can easily see how those straight lines relate to each other. So I can look here, it might be hard to see in the, in the film, but I can look here and I can see that I have a nice straight line all the way along there and all the way along there. Mm -hmm. And I can do the same up here. Now, I'm not picking the file all the way up off my work, but I'm also not having any pressure on that backstroke. If I only cut in one direction, this sort of bone is not likely to take teeth off of it anyway. Okay. Now here I'm going to cut in a little further because it's a little thicker. And you can see that you have that even straight line that's following the thickness of the material. Okay. Then once you have that established, then you can just file while turning your piece evenly. Take those corners off and you will be left with a nice even round piece. But when you're using a file, it will always be a little bit faceted. You, the facets might not be obvious. It might not, you know, glare at you that there's a facet, but it will always be a little bit faceted. So the last thing then you want to do is you want to take your sandpaper against your soft fingertip. And since it has some get to it, it will conform to the piece that you're working. And that will be your final roundness. And then if you're doing something simple and utilitarian, you might be happy just with uh, 220 grit sandpaper. If you want to do something a little fancier, you might want to move down to a finer grit. So it's going to take quite a bit of time to fully round all of this off. So once again, I'm going to just stop the recording and work on it, and then we'll come back together when the whole thing is finished. Thank you so much for watching, and if you have found this fish hook an enjoyable little project, I would be most grateful if you gave it a thumbs up or had a little chat in the comment section below. It helps the YouTube algorithm know that you have enjoyed it and will show it to others. And I hope that you will continue along as we go through this series and join us in the next video, which will be the two-piece composite fish hook. So I'll see you there.